All right. Welcome, everybody. I hope everybody is healthy and happy and still being safe. Seems like there's some confusion about what exactly it means right now with us in phase two-ish. But we all need to continue to stay, stay safe. We are starting to work towards, you know, what's gonna, we're going to need to do to open back up. But still going to be a, a while before before that happens i think the university really really wants to take it slow but i do i am going to try something new i have a poll for everybody today so i'm going to launch this poll it's just three questions it's pretty quick and we'll send it out there and let everybody answer quickly hopefully and then I'll, I will shut it down. Give you a few minutes to, to answer questions. It's only taken me two months to figure some of these things out like polls. We can give everybody a few more minutes to, to be able to log in here, to be able to answer questions. Chris sent a reminder out to remember to mute your microphones. But as we're going along, if you have a question and you want to ask it out loud, you can unmute and, and, and ask. I don't, I don't mind that. Or you can put it in the chat for Chris to answer. But I do like some feedback while I'm talking. I think I forgot to put that you've never been here. Oh well. All right, give everybody a few more minutes as they keep coming in. While people are doing this, I will, I will say, I don't think it's on our calendar yet because I don't think I've given information to Chris, but we will continue doing this midweek with Mark through June. And next week we'll do deer resistant ish plants something that everybody always asks about so we'll do, we'll do a talk based around those it'll be good i'll keep everybody muted so that when i say this plant's deer resistant i won't i won't hear five people saying it isn't in my garden they eat it in my garden so it's the perfect venue for talking about deer resistant plants And then after that, if people are interested, and you can give feedback to me or Chris, if you don't want to offend me, I was thinking maybe it's a real busy week, and I was thinking maybe I would do rather than a put together a PowerPoint, maybe I would do a tour of my own personal garden a little bit. Somebody mentioned, I guess last week was it, week before, that I talked about plants in my garden that I'd share with the Arboretum and they thought that was odd and it's because sometimes when I purchase something that I don't know how it's going to do I don't want to spend Arboretum money so I purchase it myself and grow it and then I will you know share the whole plant or a division or a seed or something from my garden to the Arboretum of course they go the other way too from the Arboretum to my house as well yeah, I'll show you around some of my gardens. Maybe you, you get to meet my wife. I'll get her to, or my son, one of them. I'll get one of them to, to videotape me. So, or whatever. Well, I don't know what you say. Call it when you use your phone. Digitally record me. But, yeah, so it seems like at least a few people are saying they'd be interested in that. So, yeah, we'll, we'll plan on that for two weeks from now. It's a new garden, I gotta warn you though, I've only been in the house for a few years, so it's a new garden. So don't be, don't be overly impressed or excited. All right, so, and then I'll get the rest, the next couple talks, I'll, I'll, I'll get those together. If you, if you have suggestions, you can throw them in the chat and Chris can tell me afterwards and I can see if I feel like I, I can actually actually do those things. 
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get started now with our talk today. This is all about, you know, kind of what we're doing at the Arboretum, you know, what, how we're in, moving on our mission, improving our mission. Just a little bit about kind of the, the big picture of what we're, what we're doing and why we're doing it. So, the, um, all right, Chris, is that pole still up? I believe it still shows that it's active. It's still counting five minutes, 35 seconds. Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and end it. Hopefully most everybody participated. All right. Not yet. I was going to do it at the end. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. I'm not sure. I have to take it off and I'm not sure if I'll be able to put it back up there, but that's All right. Fine. Well, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I just, I got in late. That's, that's, it's okay. We're just something we're playing around with a little bit. Before I get started, I'll mention a few things that are that are coming up. Gardens around the world, English speaking version. This is going to be five Mondays through June. Mostly Bryce, but I will also talk a little bit about South Africa and New Zealand, maybe Wales. Kind of depends on where where Bryce is, but we'll we'll spot, talk about a few of them. Should be a lot of fun. Bryce is always great and he has fantastic pictures of these, these gardens. So I know he's done some history of gardening that hit some of these places and it's people's favorites of his. I think he did it and everybody liked it so much that he had to do a hist you know, history of gardening part two. Um, but this is gonna talk a little bit more about the, the contemporary gardens. Also want to mention again the Southeastern Plant Symposium at home on June 12th. This is going to be an amazing uh, program. We've got garden friend Dan Hinckley. He's uh, long been associated with the Arboretum. In fact, he has a, a Tibetan prayer flag out in his garden for JC when JC passed away. Uh, Nick Maser, Pan Global Plants in the United Kingdom. One of the uh, just best plantsman I've I've ever been around. Always amazing. Dan's Dan's gonna be doing a walk around his garden. So you'll get, you know, oh, I may have done this wrong. I probably shouldn't have done a walk around my garden two or three days before Dan's doing a walk around his garden because mine does not compare to to Dan's garden at Windcliff. Tony Avent, we all know and love. He's gonna be talking about the crevice garden. John Cho, who bred all the, the Royal Hawaiian Colocasias, working with Tony. John's interesting. He's actually a, a plant pathologist, I believe, who was breeding Colocasias for disease resistance for eating, for taro. Boy. And Tony convinced him to do some, some you know, colorful ones as well. And then Kelly and Sue Dodson, who own Far Reaches Farm, and, and the Botanical Conservancy there, kind of trying to do what, what Tony's doing with Juniper Level Botanic Garden and saving it for the future. Kelly and Sue, you want to talk about plants people, they actually met on a plant collecting trip in China. So they are both just great, great um, plants folks. And then Jimmy Turner, he's going to be talking about some Australian plants that may ultimately prove to be worth trying to grow in the southern U.S. He just came back from a stint at the Sydney Botanic Garden and is now the newly minted director of the Red Butte Botanic Garden, which is one of really one of the great undersung botanic gardens in the country. And they're in Salt Lake City with the University of Utah. And then one or a couple more things, the art and science of pruning with Bryce Lane. This is going to be a 
virtual workshop, but I think it should be really good. I was talking with Bryce. He's really excited about kind of what the possibilities are doing this online, really being able to, to show some things in different ways that is harder doing it face to face. So he's, he's pretty excited. And the newest thing to go up, I don't think they're actually out yet. I don't think they'll be available until next week, but we are doing three virtual summer camps. I think red, general registration won't be, I believe, until next week. But Elizabeth Overcash, the, the, the person behind our children's programs, is, is really excited about this. I think when we had to cancel summer camp, she was pretty dejected. And, you know, the thought of doing it virtually seemed pretty far out of reach, but then, uh, you know, she got to thinking and like everybody on our staff really, you know, really thought through how we could do some things differently, how we could make things valuable for, for people and is, has gotten really excited about what, what she's doing and think this is going to be a really fun program for kids. So got kids who've been tired of being at home. Well, they'll still be at home, but they'll have some fun stuff to do. So keep an eye open for that. I noticed on the poll, it looked like a lot of people probably don't have first graders at home based on the, the age groups we have. But if you have grandkids, neighbors, friends, you know, let them, let them know about this because it, it's, it's going to be a neat way to spend some quality time with doing something interesting and botanically related. Okay. And I should say, this is kind of all these things that we're talking about are really what I'm going to be talking about in terms of growing the Arboretum. We are, you know, the capacity we have to do things is, is really, has grown tremendously. And the staff here has, has not just because of this pandemic before this, but, but during this as well, has embraced technology to make what we do better. You know, Chris has been videotaping lectures and things here at the Arboretum for, for years now, long before most other people even thought about doing that. And, you know, so making more and more of those things available, trying out new technologies. It's, it's just, it, it's amazing. And it goes beyond that, but it really, you know, that's the kind of spirit that, that has really helped the Arboretum to grow. So going back to, you know, the early days here, when J.C. Ralston got here, he observed that, that wherever you were in the U.S., there were about 40 plants made up 90% of the landscape, what was available in nurseries. And so the Arboretum's founding purpose was to diversify the American landscape. So more money could be made in the nursery industry, more people could enter the industry because more plants were being grown. It also would give you know, other parts of the green industry, like landscapers, more, more work because you could, if you had people who were doing growing niche plants, you know, native plants, plants for wet areas, things like that, then it gave more opportunities to specialize in as a landscaper. So it was really all about the green industry and supporting the green industry that JC, you know, really wanted to diversify the American landscape. And so what he did was he got plants and he planted them. And then the example I always love is, you know, we we're always told conifers don't grow in the South. So JC planted them and I guess we find they do grow in the South. Not all of them, some of them don't like it, but a lot of them grow really, really well in about three years, double the height of the ultimate height that we're told they'll get. <clears throat> And so that's what he did. He grew plants, he evaluated them, he got them in the hands of nurserymen and other botanic gardens and enthusiasts and plant breeders and really connected people with plants and the plants to people. And that's still what we, we try to do. Having plants planted in different areas like the, the old laugh house that was gorgeous. It's always been my favorite place in the Arboretum. You know, as we move forward, we're always trying to serve the same purpose, serve more purposes, but, but also do it in a more attractive way. So, you know, our new Lath House, not so new anymore, it's, it's coming up on eight years old, is, you know, won awards for Frank Harmon, the architect who designed it, designed it. So it's always about that. It's always about as we change and evolve. It's not about not doing something we were doing before. It's always about doing more and doing it better, doing it in a more aesthetic manner, doing it so that we get 
more so we get something else out of it. And I think, you know, I always say, I think we do our plan evaluations in about as attractive way as you could possibly do it, thanks to great staff, uh, both paid and aid. Our volunteers are amazing. And, and so we really have grown what the, the Arboretum is as a garden. But it, it goes beyond just a pretty place, for sure. Chris is most of the driving force behind our, our website. And so there's an lot, awful lot on our website that you don't even think about or know about. You know, Chris came to me a couple of years ago and said, well, uh, the, I don't know, the, the internet rulers, I, I, don't, I don't even know enough to talk about it intelligently, but Google, maybe their search engines, you know, they look for how user friendly is your, are your sites? Do they work on computers and phones? Do they work with people who need hearing assistance on the, you know, on the computers, people who have disabilities, does, does it work with, for them? And, you know, Chris was like, we're at, you know, 78%, you know, compliance or whatever. I'm going to work to make it, you know, make sure this is accessible for everybody. And so he changes things up that the, the page you're looking at doesn't look any different, but what's behind there changes so that we can, we can reach more people. And I think it's important that, that folks know that, that there is a tremendous amount of work, much like, much like in the garden that people are familiar with. We build the soil. You don't see that. You see the plants growing and see how well they're growing. Same thing with our website. You don't necessarily see the work that goes in behind that. And we try to have everything out there that we can. Once upon a time, our publications say, were our newsletters were behind a, you had to put in a, a password, which I'm sure some of y'all remember doing. And that was because we wanted to save that for our members. And you know, then we got together as staff, and we thought well, our members are not joining so they can get a newsletter. They believe in what we do. They want access to our programs. They want access to our plants and, and they support our mission. So why, why should we hold back information? You know, that's, that goes against our kind of our, our core beliefs and that we want to share. We've always shared our plants. We want to share our knowledge too. So we put our newsletters out there so that everybody could enjoy them. There are some gardens that don't like to show what plants they're growing, but we do. We love being able to show our plants. And you can search on our website. And you can get, find pictures of the plants. You can find some information about it. You can, you know, see that it's been photographed and you can even find where it is. There's a lot of folks who don't want you to be able to necessarily find plants in their garden because they, they worry about the safety of the plants. And if you click on that little, that bed number right there that's highlighted, it'll take you to a map. Now, again, this is something we're talking about growing the Arboretum, people don't realize. We, it used to take you to a static map and it would, it would out circle where that plant was. Now you can see, all right, this plant that's outlined is Calicanthus Ralstonia Hartledge wine. You get some information about it. But what if you wanna know what this plant right beside it is? And this works if you're at home, but it also works if you're out in the garden. And you know, sometimes our plants grow so well, they swallow the labels and you can't find a label. You search for a plant next to it on our website and then go over and look at that plant. So if you were to click on that plant right there, what you would see is that's Lithocarpus edulis starburst, a variegated Japanese tan bark oak. And here's some information about it. And you can keep doing that. You could, you could go all the way down and, and find out what all these plants are because this is now live. And you can, you know, here's that, that calicanthus. The first thing I clicked on there is it with a little circle, but you can see where it is in terms of the whole garden. It's up here on our Cascade Walk, you know, and you could, from here, you could click on anything, although it gets tough when you're way out like this because you have plants layered on top of plants, layered on top of plants. You may have a tree and then a shrub and then herbaceous perennial underneath it. So, it helps to be able to zoom in, but it's, it's amazing what, what this, the power this now has for our visitors, for researchers who want to use this for ourselves as we're, we're working with it. And it's a lot of work. It takes staff to draw those little plants in. When we plant something, we have to draw it. And when we go back and do a map review with volunteers and, you know, this patch of perennial or this calicanthus is now twice as big, we have to go in and 
redraw that. So it's just, it's phenomenal what goes in and making the Arboretum a better and better resource for ourselves, but also for other researchers, because we can really show, you know, how things have grown over time and that sort of thing. And then, of course, we have all the photos in there. One of our biggest resources and something that we're, brings people to our site more very often are the photos. If you search for a plant, odds are, especially if it's an oddball thing, our site will come up because we have a picture of it. So when you can look, I'm coming in May, what, what's going to be in flower? Or maybe you're at home and going, well, I guess I'm not going to the Arboretum in May. I wonder what's in flower there. You can see this. Or you can look at it as a list. What, you know, what are all the plants that we have? When do they flower? It's great. I tell master gardeners who are writing, you know, articles for their newsletters and things, how tremendous this is to be able to go in and look at when plant was photographed in flower at the Arboretum. Now, if you're in the western part of the state, it may be quite a bit different, but this tells you when we have photographed the plant in flower at the Arboretum. I just think it's, it's a, such a great resource. We have other resources like the Propagation Guide, which is for professionals. It's, it's not much of a fun read. It's really just a list of plants with codes by their names. I put out a, did this book really just, you know, that comes out of my experience here and other places, but to help people become better gardeners because the more people who are better gardeners, the more diversify the, the American landscape, all going back to, you know, JC's original goal. And I've, I've talked about students. That's part of what we do at the Arboretum. And it's one area where I'd like to grow more. Students have probably used the Arboretum in some ways, the horticulture students, less than they did before. And that's because they have some dedicated space right behind the Arboretum in, in the Hort Field Lab to do some of the projects they used to do in the Arboretum. But they still use the Arboretum quite a bit. And where we have grown is we have more students from different departments that are using the the arboretum I, I counted up one time all the departments that i knew were using the, the arboretum and not as a background space i'm not talking about you know like the design studio having a fashion show out here but actually using the arboretum and its collections and, and it was something like 11 different departments just at nc state were had used it while i'd been here so, you know, that's great, but the, the dean, and I think this came from, from maybe the chancellor, is he, he said this, and it really stuck with me, that over the next 25 years, 84% of U.S. agricultural jobs are, are going to be in the plant sciences, but 80% of students are enrolling in the College of Ag and Life Science here for animal science majors. You know, they want to be vets or they want to be marine biologists or, or farmers, but we really need people in the plant sciences, horticulture, plant biology, agronomy, crop and weed science. We need people in these, these disciplines because that's where the growth is, is, going, is, is going in the, the U.S. <clears throat> so we can't wait until there are already students here in departments that are already, already plant science-based departments. So that's why we started a children's program to, to make a pipeline into, the, into NC State and other colleges to really expose children to the plant sciences and make them think about it as a career and make their parents think about it as a career. You know, that's, I've got two children who you know, aren't entirely sure what they want to do with their lives, despite being adults, both of them. But you know, if they were going into school and I wasn't where I was now and they said, I'm going to, I'm going to go to horticulture or I want to go to plant biology. I would say, what are you going to do with that? There aren't any jobs in that, are there? But that's where the jobs are. That is where the jobs are. So, you know, we really worked on this. And as you can see from those camps, we do everything from preschool up through middle school and then even work with a high school program that's that's designed to to bring students in and that's something that probably jc would have never thought about doing that as much as a mentor as he was for the students here but he would have said children's programming isn't what we're about but i think if we want to have the the future leaders in horticulture and agriculture 
we have to get them early and get them excited about plants. I mean, that's, that's the one thing we're great about is, is really sharing our passion for plants and horticulture. And the kids get it, trust me, they, they love it here. And staff and volunteers are great about that, you know? The, the key is don't talk down to them. Kids are so smart. They, they really can. They really do understand if you give them interesting things to talk about and to do and to experiment with, they, they definitely respond well. So, and I put this up before, and really this is, this is not the whole story. We need people to work in 90 degree heat. And we have the best volunteers anywhere ever. I mean, and the, the volunteer, it's, the number of hours has grown over the past couple of years from like 10,000 hours per year till 12,000 hours per year till is 14 or 15,000 in 2019. We will see a decrease in 2020, unfortunately, since we don't have volunteers here for a good chunk of the year. But, you know, that's a program that keeps growing and we keep bringing volunteers into new areas, not just volunteers who are working in the garden or stuffing envelopes but volunteers who are helping with all the new programs we do, like Moonlight in the Garden and things like that. You know, of course, we needed new volunteers for children's program when we started that. And even, you know, we have volunteers who, you know, we, we find what their strengths are. And I think there's somebody on this who's listening right now who has, was incredibly experienced with some computer programs and files that, that made our life when we were doing Moonlight in the Garden incredible much, much immensely more doable because he could help us with some of the technical side to dealing with the 11,000 people who were registering for our program. Without that help, we would have been hours and hours and hours every day kind of manually going through the 11,000 registrations. So we're always looking for our volunteers or how about a volunteer who we find out is does great woodworking and so builds us a Airbnb that's fine cabinetry work on a B hotel. So it really is our volunteers, just the, the ways they help us out are just go so above and beyond what most gardens use their volunteers for, but we know the skill set that, that they bring to us. So, you know, mostly we're known but for our plants, of course, you know, talk about these other things, but people know us because of our plants, which we like because that's where kind of what we think of first when we think of the Arboretum as well. And you can just look, we've got a lot of plants. We're, we're evaluating a lot of things. And look at these numbers planted just in, in, in last year. And then I took a kind of a five year from 2014 to the end of 2019, you know, what what we had done. And it's, it's pretty astounding, these numbers that, that we put out there. We were talk, I was talking with some, some of our colleagues in, at other gardens and it, with a, information like this that we were comparing. And they came back and said, you know, some of them came back and said, do you accession every plant individually? You know, if you get five of the same shrub, do you, do you accession them separately? I said, no, we accession them all the same. And same thing when we plant it. If we plant something as a mass, we, we you know, a bunch of perennials, we, we, you know, record that as one planting, not individual plants. So they were really just amazed at, at the numbers that, that we do. Mark, what does a session mean? Oh, thank you. So whenever we get a new plant in, or whenever we get a plant in, it is accessioned. It's given a... a distinct number. So, and that can be different things. We can get in a packet of seed and we'll sow them and they all come up and all those plants will have the same accession number because they came, they were the same exact source. If we get, if I go out and buy five of the same shrub from the same place, they all get the same accession number. Now, if I go out and buy a sixth one of that same shrub or I'm given one from a nut, like a guard, another garden gives us that same plant, that would get a different accession number. So it's, it's a way of that museums track their collections. So just like a museum, an art museum would accession a new painting or sculpture, we do that with, with plant material. And we send that accession number on when we share our plants with other botanical institutions. And they, you know, that way we get 
queries all the time. Somebody from, you know, the Morton Arboretum outside Chicago will get in touch and say, hey, we got this Styrax number 860915 from, from you quite a few years ago. Uh, can you tell us anything about it? Well, we can look it up at that 860951 or whatever number I said, and we can say, we can go back and say, well, that was a Styrax that was collected in Korea by uh, JC when he did his collecting there. Or we could say, you know, that came from seed from the Taiwan Forestry Research Institute, or we purchased that plant from forest farms. But all of our accessions have a unique identifier on there. So all those, those plants. And then when I say different taxa, that means those are, we may have collected, say, in the wild, say we went and collected a bunch of Magnolia virginiana. Those would all have different accession numbers if we collected them all over, you know, throughout their range. But it would be the same taxa. It's, they're all Magnolia virginiana. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. All right, I'm glad to answer. I'm glad you asked that. We get our plants all over the place. I mentioned JC going to Korea. He went to Korea and China, and he traveled around all over the place. We still do that to go out and collect plants. That's still part of, of who we are and what we do. But we don't do it just to get plants. We do it to make connections. This is Binji from the Chen Shen Botanic Garden, but he's with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He's the he's the curator of the herbarium there, and this is him showing showing me the, the herbarium there. This is Liu Gang, one of my oldest friends in China. Man, I like to get a magnifying gla glass out and look at this picture. We got Shiflera there, got Cuba there, got Woodwardia, some kind of aster. Oh man, all kinds of good stuff in this picture. But, you know, it's not just about going places and seeing them. It's about working with them and learning what they're doing, learning about, you know, Lou's a nurseryman. So I learn about the nursery industry in, in China from him. Benji's a researcher, so learn more about that, the research side. But we work with folks at universities and organizations all over, over there. But the, the other part is we bring them over here. This is Lou Gang visiting one of our North Carolina nurseries. This is Hoffman Nursery, growing grass there. And that was a place that Lou wanted to visit. So we went out there and, and really saw what they did and how they operated. They showed us all the, the high-tech stuff they had. They showed us the low-tech tech stuff they had. They, they really took, you know, spent time with us. And, we, and I've done that with multiple colleagues from... China and Japan and other places to, to bring them around. And it's all, it's, it's great for everybody. I think John and David Hoffman there got something out of the visit with Lou and vice versa. And of course we, we visit nurseries as well. That's one of the places we get plants, not all wild collecting. It's purchasing plants from nurseries, although we do relatively little purchasing of plants. It's a lot of times it's trading plants back and forth. This is out at Cistus. We, in, in Oregon, we send plants back and forth all the time. And, you know, and it's fun with people on the other side of the, the country, you know, when I, we, we get something from them and it's, you know, this dwarf plant and we plant it out here where it gets lots of rainfall and, you know, grows th three times the size and half the time, you know, we can tell them that. Or when we see their, their catalogs and it says, this is a zone eight plant, we can go back and say, hey, we've been growing this for six years. It's gone through some solid zone 7B winters. It's definitely a little bit hardier than you're thinking it is out, out here on the west, on the east coast. And, you know, that gets incorporated back into their catalogs and descriptions and things. There's always little treasures to be found, big nurseries, small nurseries all over the place. We also get plants um, from our, our colleagues across the, around the world. There's worldwide a network of botanic gardens that share their plants through seed exchanges, index semina as they're called, and they are, they're free. If you are a botanical institution, you can request seed. They'll put out a list. Index semina means literally seed list, and they will send you the plants. We have done that for years, many plants from, from different seed exchanges. In fact, I met Luke, my buddy Lou Gang because he wanted to visit here because 
JC used to order so many plants from so many so much seed from the Shanghai Botanic Garden with Lou work there. So we've been getting plants this way for years, but now we actually contribute back and we ha- put out our own seed list and and ship seed all over the all over the world. And of course, we're still breeding plants. Our most recent introductions in collaboration with Denny Werner are Golden Falls Red Bud and Flamethrower Red Bud. Just this morning, I got a request for, where can I find this plant? And I said, well, this fall, it'll be a little bit more widely available, but we're still helping introduce and breed some of the most innovative plants anywhere in the world like this. And we've just hired, I don't think all the paperwork's been signed yet, but just hired a new faculty member in, for the department who is going to work with the, the Ralston Arboretum uh, in their plant breeding work. So very excited about that, that that's going to be, you know, one more arm that is formally part of what we're doing is, is plant breeding on a full-time basis. And of course, a lot of the plants that we're evaluating, we're evaluating them just observationally. We're seeing what does well, what doesn't do well, but we do have formal evaluations as well. You know, our color plant trials and perennial plant trials, our companies pay to be a part of those trials to have the plants there. And we, you can go back and look at the last, you know, quarter of a century of trials on our website, the the data from that, which is tremendous resource. We have been part of the national boxwood trials. Those, when boxwood blight came, those kind of evaluation kind of went on, went to the wayside a bit. We get plants from nurseries and they ask us to trial them. So we get trees from Dre Frank Schmidt and son and we'll report back on them. We get plants from Connor Pyle and we'll report back on them. We get uh, plants from Walter's Gardens and, and Terra Nova Nurseries and, and we you know, we report back on them, some more formally than others, but it's, you know, this is a part of, of what we do to evaluate these plants. Mark, how long does it take to run a trial, or how long do you trial a plant before you make a conclusion? Well, that's a real interesting question, how long does it take? We don't have necessarily set times for things. In general, you would, you want at least three years for a herbaceous perennial. And if you don't have a good cold winter or dry summer, you probably want to continue it on. You want at least at least five years for a shrub, preferably seven. And then, you know, really seven to 10 years for a tree is, is ideal. But we, you know, we start evaluating them earlier than that. Sometimes we'll make conclusions earlier than, than that. We'll just decide something's not really a great plan. It gets insects every year or something, something along those lines. But, but really, you do want to give it some time. And that's one of the big problems. Things are being introduced without that real evaluation time. There is an umbrella organization, the American Public Gardens Association, that we are a member of, active member of. We've given talks there. I give a talk at their annual symposium it seems like almost every year, every other year or so. I know Chris has given talks there. Elizabeth Overcash has given talks there. I served on there as the committee chair for this plant collections network when we kind of revamped from what used to be called the North American Plant Collections Consortium, which was a mouthful to the plant collections network. And we have plants in this. This is kind of where we have instead of everybody trying to duplicate what every other garden is doing, we are, some gardens say, we are going to hold the, this collection. So in that sense, we are a red bud collection holder for the plant collections network. We hold the the national, a nationally accredited collection of Cersus. We're the only Cersus collection. Sometimes there are multiple collections. We're also a collection holder for Magnolia. And I misspelled that. That should be Chrysanthemum flora. This is actually old. It's not 15 institutions. I think it's up to 17 institutions now across the country from us to Quarry Hill Botanical Garden and on the West Coast. You've got things farther north like Scott Arboretum, you know, British Columbia, University of Florida. I think there's one in, oh yeah, Henry Foundation. That's they're just doing Eastern U.S. natives, so everybody can have their their niche, but we're part of that, and it's really great for us because we don't like to hold on to plants forever, so 
if we're working with other institutions and we want to take out a rare magnolia, we can make sure that we get that distributed to the other gardens before we remove it. But it's, it's a way to, we, with this magnolia group, we compile all of our information and then we can look at what's missing, what species are missing, what, how should we focus our efforts? So we received a grant from Magnolia Society International to go collect Taiwanese magnolias because we could, we could look at all these gardens that held magnolia collections and see that Taiwan magnolias were woefully underrepresented. So we, we were able to do that and distribute a lot of, of magnolias out of, out of that. So it's a great program. And we also introduced plants that we're growing here that we watch and see that they're superior. After the 2007 hundred year drought, Viburnum obovatum was the best performer. And we introduced Ralston Hardy, which when we put it into production, this one proved to be much hardier in nursery production than some of the other dwarfs like Mrs. Schiller's Delight. And this has been very popular. Same thing, Circus Chinensis K's Early Hope, a plant that we had looked at and watched and paid attention to for years, years, and finally decided, okay, it's enough watching. This is one of the best Chinese red buds we've ever seen. We're gonna put a name on it. So we named it after Kiao. And it is in the trade, people are growing it. They really like it. It's become a popular landscape plant. Both of these have. If you go out by campus and see the D.H. Hill Library, they redid it reopened the entrance from Hillsborough Street, put some seating out there, and it's planted with, I don't know, a couple hundred uh, Ralston Hardy Viburnums. And so we work with nurseries to get these in. We could have this Ralston Hardy Dwarf Viburnum or Kay's Early Hope Red Bud, and we could propagate them and send them to our friends and nurserymen, and that all helps really helps to get the plants out. But we also do formal programs. This Choice Plants program is a collaboration between us and the Johnston County Nursery Association. And they have been just thrilled to death with what we've been able to do. They are selling a lot of plants with these Choice Plants tags on them and really doing quite well. We've had a few busts in there, plants that perhaps I got the nurserymen excited about that maybe I needed a little bit better sense over what would what would actually sell. But we're getting there. And we've got some really cool stuff that we're evaluating right now that I think we're going to put out very soon that are going to have these tags. We actually, we've got a couple that nurseries are waiting on tags for us. And it's just, it's just a matter of time of getting them, getting them completed because they probably had to start selling them without the tags. And we're still always looking for the next thing. This is one that some of the nurserymen were pretty excited about. I'm not gonna go through a whole bunch of, of plants, but you know, that's not a bad little euonymus tree. We don't get too many euonymus trees in our landscapes, although there are quite a few. You know, I touched on children's education, but we have quite a bit of adult education, as you all know. And that has grown and changed over time. We've got this, our Southeastern Plant Symposium, which is a new symposium. We've got, seems like we're, we're adding more and more workshops and multi-day things as that seems to be what people are interested in. So it's, it's, that's always growing. We're always saying we need to drop something if we're going to add something else. And yet we never, everything stays popular. So it's hard to drop anything, but we just keep, keep growing and growing and growing. We also do trips, and those may be day trips in the area to other gardens or, or other places like that. Longer, you know, long weekend trips, which we, we, we've been trying to ramp some of those up, but pandemic kind of put a, the kibosh on the one we had in, in, plan, in place. But we're also do, you know, a yearly, mostly international trip. And actually, we've gotten some real push to do more, if we could, of these international trips, like this one to the UK. Or maybe this might, this might be, no, this, is, this is the UK. We keep doing those, and they keep selling out, getting ready to shortly we'll announce what our 2021 plans are. We are making plans for travel in 2021, and I think it's going to be a pretty exciting one. But these keep growing because people are interested. So, so far with these, these trips as we're running them now, we've been to the UK and to the Lake region of, of France and, and Lake region of Italy and Southern France. And 
Cuba and New Zealand and South Africa, really been, been tra traveling all over the place to see some of the, the great gardens of the world. And, you know, I travel a lot, you know, this is me in a hobbit hole, but I didn't go to New Zealand to visit, to visit the Shire. When I went was, you know, our education goes beyond our gates, you know, it was to go to the Botanic Garden Congress in internationally and speak on a panel with colleagues from around the world. Or, you know, when I went to Korea, I, both these trips I wrapped into plant collecting trip, but I was in Korea for this Sunshine International Garden and Industry Symposium to talk about the U.S. green industry trends and, and future opportunities. And that was a panel, it was myself representing the U.S., the head of the Horticultural Trades Association in England, a Japanese landscape architecture professor, and a Chinese landscape architect who had created an international garden expo in Wuhan. It's not me that they want, it's the, it's the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, the knowledge and the, the respect that people have around the world about and for the, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum is really quite astounding. And then of course, our other piece is we like to get the plants out as well. It's all well and good to get bring plants in, but we want to get them out. And we do that with, with plant sales, of course, and these keep getting bigger and bigger. Through our Connoisseur Plants program, where as a thank you for members at higher levels, we have some, some real special things for them. I mentioned the, the index seminar, the seed list. We, in conjunction with our, our partner institution, Juniper Level Botanic Garden, we put out a, a really impressive seed list every year and people all over the, the world order from it. I, I wish I could tell you exactly how many people, how many different countries ordered, but I don't have that information in front of me, although we could get it because we track all of that. And as always, we let nurserymen come in and take cuttings. That's done less and less than it used to be. Now we more often will send cuttings to nurseries who will produce plants for other growers, but we still do allow nurserymen to come in and take cuttings to start their plants. Not quite a free for all as it used to be. We, we, we have conversations with them about what they can take and can't take and how much, but we want to share the plants. That's why we, we have the plants so that they can be shared. And of course, the big one is our still our giveaway, which gives some, some folks in public horticulture hives, like you're just giving away all these plants. If you just got $2 per plant and you're giving away 4,000, that'd be $8,000. Yeah, but it's so much fun to give plants away. We love giving them away. And, and people leave pretty darn happy with, with those plants. So to, to sum it up, you know, what is the JCRA? We are one of the premier resources nationally and internationally for plants and plant information. We are on a, a university level. We believe we're one of the best gateways to North Carolina State University for, for non-alums. And other than, the, other than athletics, we're the primary public face of the university for, for non-alums. That's where more people interact with the university than the other way. Last year's Moonlight in the Garden with 11,000 tickets was the largest ticketed event, non-athletic ticketed event at NC State last year. So we really are a public face for them. And we find, test, and promote superior plants for a changing world. We were the first green roof in the UNC system, not just NC State, but the entire UNC system. We have been testing plants on, on a green roof. We've been working with rain gardens for years. We've, you know, we're looking not just at what are great garden plants, but what are great garden plants for now and into the future as things change and as we, we find ourselves in, in a different world. And ultimately, and this is what JC did so well and what he didn't, doesn't necessarily get the credit he deserves for this. He didn't introduce 
so many plants to the industry, new plants to the industry. What he did was he got plants from all over and he got them out to the right people so that they got into the, the public sphere. And that's still what we try to do, both from the nursery level, trying to get, oh, hey, you know, with this line that you're growing, you might want to try growing this. This will be good for with what you're doing. Oh, hey, you're breeding these plants. Let me get you these wild collective germplasm we have, or let me, let me get you this, this new different thing that we just came across that'll work with your breeding program. But it's also, we, when a visitor comes through and walks through and they see things they haven't seen before and they have an experience that moves them out here, that's connecting people to plants. When we have a summer camp and kids are planting basil seed or mustard seed or they're harvesting vegetables and cooking with them or they're coming out on a tour and they're, they're learning about plant adaptations, that's connecting uh, people to plants. So it's really, that's, that's what we want is we want to get people as passionate and as excited about plants as we all are here. And that's, that's who we are and that's how we continue to grow. And you know, throughout this shutdown period, as I talk to my colleagues at other gardens and they are singing woe is me stories, I'm talking with my staff and I'm hearing that we may be on a record setting year for memberships in the month of May. And we are almost, almost keeping even with our membership January 1 through the end of May. And we may actually get there this year, January 1 through the end of May, you know, kind of year on year. And, and every year that membership's been growing. And I think part of the key has been, we haven't gone in for all these extraneous things that a lot of gardens are doing to attract people what we do is stay true to our mission. We really focus on this mission to connect people to plants and help grow the nursery industry and, and really are, are grounded in that. So even when people can't visit us, they believe in the mission we have and know that we are doing everything we can to, to fulfill that mission. And so people still, you know, continue to support us. And it's been really gratifying for myself and I think especially for my staff because I get to hear a lot of the, the accolades when people say nice things, they say it to me. But I think it's really shown the rest of the staff really clearly how much our, our members and our supporters and our community really believes that what we do is important and is needed and is worth supporting even even now. So it feels good to know that that you are hopefully doing the the right thing in staying true to your to what what your foundations are. So while we may grow and do new things like children's program, the goal is the same. It's to it's to connect people to plants. Just shorter and younger ones. So, thank you all for letting me talk about, brag about what we do here. I am incredibly, incredibly proud of the staff we have here and the dedication they put into everything we do. There, it's just, it's tremendously gratifying to, to work with to work with such tremendous people, the paid staff and the volunteer staff. All right. So, the question in the chat was someone wants to see the results of the survey. Okay. Which I'm not too sure are shareable. I know I can get them. I am sharing them now. Yes. Yes. I can see it. Okay. So, we have two thirds are members, one third is not. Hopefully maybe something we said, we'll have them consider joining us. We've got almost half, 44% visit regularly. This is pre-coronavirus, 34% visit occasionally. 
just a handful have been once or twice. Half of them use their website. Good job, Chris. Yay. Uh, a lot of them use the YouTube channel. A lot of them attend tours and programs. Only a few weddings. Oh, I thought Moonlight in the Garden was going to be going to be even higher than that. That surprises <laughs> me. And Ralston Blooms, 29%. So, these young people don't like technology so much. They don't like these newfangled devices. But as we get older, we get, we get higher usage. The, the truth on that, you know why this is? We do get younger people watching this. I know we do because I, I talk to some of them. They all watch YouTube. Doing, doing something live like this, I, I, my kids would no more think of doing something live. My son had a, had a class, an online class, and the teacher wanted to do it live like this for the class, and they don't want that. They want to be able to watch a video, do, you know, interact like that, and do it on their time. And that's, that's the difference. The older generation is, is embracing the technology and learning how to use it, but the younger generation wants to be able to, the internet is so you can do things whenever you want to. You can register for a program at three o'clock in the morning. You can order food whenever you can find out the information. You can watch a video of the Arboretum, you know, at, at you know, first thing in the morning. So that's, that's the difference with adults and with the, the older generation and the younger generation. It also looks like it's unanimous for the tour of your garden. Some have actually mentioned other staff gardens too. Oh yeah, we could do that. I think there's some staff who'd be happy to do that. Yeah. So a couple of other questions. Do we evaluate invasive dispositional when we bring in plants? Of course, that's, that's a huge part of what we do. The seed list, is it available to the general public? The seed list is only available to professionals, but we have considered after it goes out to professionals, we always have a lot left over. We have considered making that available in some way, maybe at a certain level of membership or, you know, maybe at a subscription fee or something. We have considered doing that. And that's something that as we move forward as closer ties with Juniper Level Botanic Garden, maybe maybe something, maybe a joint membership gets you access to that. Um, would you ever call Hyder having a form numbers required? Consider, would we ever consider having an evaluation form for general public and members who acquire plants? So, you know, yes, but that gets, it gets to be, we would need some, somebody staffing that, I think, or, or a group of members doing that. It would get, that would get to be a lot. And I only know that because it's a lot getting evaluation data from anybody. I do, and, so, and there are a few people where I've, I've told when they've acquired plants, I've said, I'm really interested to know how that's going to do for you. And there are some people who give me regular feedback. There's actually somebody who I have, he got some <laughs> Rotophyalla aracana from us, a, a South American bulb. And just this morning or yesterday, in fact, he had sent pictures to me for the, the second time of how they're doing, which they're not doing great, but they are flowering for them. Other questions? Okay, well, we have, I want to see Chris. I have, a, I have a question. Yes. Oh, you did inspire me to join about three days ago. I love that. And, uh, yeah, and I wanted to know, in the part of the information I got, it said to be sure that that you had my email address mm -hmm. so that I would get the newsletter. How do I how do I make sure that, that the Arboretum has that? The best thing would be if you go on our website, we have a list of all the staff there, and Catherine Wall is our membership coordinator. And her email's there. Just click on her email and send her your name and say, I just want to make sure you have her, her email. I, Chris put it up right here, kbwall at ncsu.edu. All right, let me. kbwall at ncsu.edu. And if anybody who's not a member would like information about membership, you can reach out to Catherine as well. That would be, that would be great. 
Thank you. There's a, I have a private question here. How do we reconcile the JCR, JCRA mission to find new plants and bring them into the state and that of the North Carolina Botanic Gardens mission, which is to promote natives? I, don't, I guess I don't reconcile them. They are, they're all good things. I love what North Carolina Botanic Garden is doing. Their native plant conservation work is amazing. In fact, just a couple of, a week or so ago, our former plant record keeper, Andrew Pace, who is now teaching at Mount Olive, got in touch with me and said, hey, Mark, we're doing some work in a wetland that's, that's Mount Olive property, and we want to see about restoring some of it. You know, can, do you have any advice on, you know, collecting them and proper techniques? And I responded back and copied Johnny Randall, who's, a he who's the head of their conservation program at North Carolina Botanic Garden. I said, you know, Johnny knows more about this than I will ever hope to know. He's the person to talk to. And I think, I believe strongly in preserving our native flora. I think our gardens and our lives are more interesting with a, a big diversity of plants. I think that a lot of non-native plants are better adapted for urban situations, especially as the world is changing. So we're bringing in, we, we bring in native plants to evaluate, but we bring in non-native plants to evaluate. And so we are two parts to the same coin. They have, they may, may sometimes have more issues with us than we do with them, but we all respect each other. We all work together. You know, I've been in close contact with my colleagues at Sarah P. Duke Gardens and UNC Botanic Garden, you know, as we talk through what, what does reopening look like for gardens in North Carolina and how are we managing it and how are we dealing with staff and all those things. We've, we've you know, we always work, work together. In fact, I think next week we were supposed to have our annual Triangle Area Gardens Luncheon where all of our staff from three university gardens and Juniper Level Botanic Garden and Keith Arboretum, all here in the Triangle, all get together and have, have lunch together and, and in order to talk about what we're doing and, and where we're going. So it's not an either or in my mind, it's a both and our missions. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you all once again for allowing me to talk about plants and what we do. Hope to see you, hope to see you some next week for our deer resistant-ish plants. Maybe a new poll with some different questions. If you have any suggestions for things you'd like me to talk about, go ahead and send a note. I'm happy doing that. And we'll have the announcements up for the future uh, midweek with Marks real soon on the website. Yep, I've got an email halfway written to Chris with what the next ones are. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank thanks you. for joining us, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Enjoyed it Bye. as always. Bye. Great. Bye. Look forward to seeing you in person. <laughs>